I'm sweating already and we haven't started, so it's going to be that day. That's okay. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Leviticus 23. Wow, it's good to be together. And it's good to sing. Last week we asked the question, what does the law teach us about sexuality? And I'm not a prophet, but I would suspect that that will be the most divisive subject issue in the church over the next 50 years. Today, interestingly enough, we come to a topic that presents us with the most divisive, divisive subject in the church over the last 50 years. This particular topic we're going to be considering today has led to church splits, has led to tribalism, has led to targeted secret church, has led to all kinds of abominations that are entirely unhelpful. And it stems out of this question we're going to ask. What does the law teach us about worship? What does the law teach us about worship? Now, it's, I'll, I'll just say this as a disclaimer off the top. There's so much that could be said about this topic. And if you know me, you know that this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm the son of a pastor. I grew up in the church. Probably around the age of 16 is when I started leading corporate worship and was doing that every week for a very long time. I went to school, got a bachelor of church music, um, and have made just so many mistakes and have put my foot in my mouth so many times that I feel like there's just been a lot of lessons that I'm really excited about that I want to share. And then as I sat down to write this sermon, of course, I've got all these things that want to come out of me. Uh, it was really good for me because uh, I wanted to, I had to root myself in this text. And there's just some powerful things coming out of this, but it's not going to be everything that we could say. And so here's one disclaimer, one thing we're not going to talk about today, but it's important enough that I want you to hear it. Obviously, when we talk about worship, there's really two senses of worship. There's gathered worship, where the people of God come together and we respond with praise and there's liturgy. And then there's the scattered worship. Like Romans 12 talks about how we are to put our lives on the altar as a living sacrifice. Everything that you do in your life is worship. So when you're raising your kids, it's worship. And when you're going to work, that's worship. And when you're doing the dishes, that's worship. Uh, And so obviously both of those are true. And today we're not going to be talking about scattered worship. That doesn't mean it's not a thing. That just means that's not what Leviticus 23 is about. This passage is forcing us to hone in on the gathered worship of God's people. And can I just say, I feel like we have been divinely, providentially situated to hear this afresh. For the last year and a half, we've been learning about scattered worship. We've been learning about how we can still worship God and love God and walk in obedience even when we can't have this gathering. And we love this gathering, but it forced us to learn that there's more to the church than the church gathered, right? We thought about the church scattered a lot. Now, I feel like we're well positioned to, to stop and say, of course, the scattered church is a thing, and that's true, but there's something beautiful about the church gathered. We need this, don't we? And so let's look to the law, and let's ask the question, what does the law teach us about this worship, this gathered assembly? As we said week after week, The law presents us, it's like going back to the kindergarten classroom, and we can say that because the Apostle Paul used that language. In Galatians, he talked about how the law is like a tutor, like a nanny of sorts. And so you can imagine there's like building blocks that are teaching us lessons, and and finger paints, and, and object lessons, illustrations. That's what the law is. It's immersive, and it teaches us these elementary lessons about who we are, and who God is, and how we should approach him. And so we're going to come back to this text And we're going to say, what are the elementary principles that should inform our worship today? So look at Leviticus 23. It's a big text. This is 44 verses. As you look at this text, here's what you should see and what you will see by the end of the day. Does anyone here use the paper uh, year calendar? Anybody have one of those on their fridge? Amanda loves these. Um, And I, I put everything into my digital calendar. And guess how well that syncs with the paper calendar? Not very well at all. Uh, So I don't quite understand the uh, affection for this paper calendar, but if you've got one, then you'll understand this. When you look at that paper calendar, you've got the whole year in a glance. Well, that's what we see in Leviticus 23. It's the whole liturgical worship year at a glance. So you want to know what Israelites were doing in their year? This is it. This is the big rock. It's the first thing they put in their calendar, and God has written worship, this corporate worship. He's written this into their calendar, and you can see how it all fits. So what we'll do this morning is we're going to walk through the text slowly. We'll unpack these festivals and ceremonies, 
and then we'll apply these elementary lessons to our worship today. Look with me now to Leviticus 23. We're going to begin by reading verses 1 to the end of verse 3. Hear now God's holy, inspired, living, and active word to us today. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. The Sabbath. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So let's, let's stop there. Here we learn our first elementary lesson about worship, and it is this. Worship rests. Worship rests. So as I said, we, this is the annual calendar. Well, before he gets into the big rock pieces, he, he puts a big rock piece that's going to appear on every single week in the Israelite calendar. On the seventh day of the week, which was Saturday, that was to be the Sabbath. And that was a day when the Israelites were to stop. To stop it all. To stop their working, stop their striving. It was to be a day of rest and worship. God knew that they needed this. See, the Sabbath was a weekly reminder for the people of God that God was God and that they were not. Because left to ourselves, we will work ourselves to death. We'll take our eyes off of Him. We'll put our eyes on all of the things that need to be done, the fields that need to be harvested, the house that needed to be tended to, the family that needs to be raised. And we will convince ourselves that this whole world spins and operates because of our striving. And the Israelites would find themselves believing that they were the gods of their universe. P.S., that's not unique to the Israelites, is it? How many of us have bought the lie that the world is spinning and rotating because of our working and striving? And if we were to take a day of rest, everything would come crashing down. Well, God wrote it right into their worship calendar, and he said, guess what? That's not true. I hold it all together. So maybe you should take your eyes off of all of your working and striving and fix your eyes on me every single week. Stop the working, stop the striving, stop the scrambling, and, and turn your heart and your affection and your focus on the one who holds it all together. That's what the Sabbath was all about. Wise, isn't it? Some of you have, have bought this lie, and, and it would be helpful for you to reclaim this principle of rest. So let me ask the question, what does this look like for us, this elementary principle of rest? Well, there are some evangelicals who believe that we should still be observing the Sabbath every Saturday. And, and people that I dearly love hold to this view. So they hold to the view that that is the day, that Saturday on every week, you should shut it all down. That should be your day of worship. They wouldn't gather on Sunday. There are people who hold to that. Now we as a church, just so you know, we don't hold to that. We don't hold to that conviction for a couple reasons. You could look to Romans 14. But let me read you Colossians 2, verses 16 to 17. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So Paul puts the Sabbath together with the food laws and the festivals, and he says, listen, all these things were wonderful, but he says they were a shadow. So you know how shadows work. So let's say you've got an object here and then the light's shining on it and of course the shadow is cast this way. Kids, does that make sense? So he's saying Christ is what it's all about. P.S. Jesus said, the law of the prophets, you search them looking for life in them. They speak of me, Jesus said. It, the light is shining on me. So Jesus is the substance and he said all of these laws and, uh, and all of the, the food laws and the Sabbath and the festivals, they're a shadow. As you look at them, they... They look kind of like what you're looking and longing for, but ultimately what you really need is the substance, which is Christ. And so that's our understanding of these things. We, we believe that they're helpful. We believe they point to truth, but we believe that the truth is Christ. Now, how did the Sabbath point forward to Christ? Well, it taught us that we were fundamentally a needy people. It taught us that our striving would never be enough. It taught us that we will ultimately work ourselves to death unless we learn to let go and rest in God's provision. It prepared us to understand this momentous announcement when Jesus said, the Son of Man, that's Christ, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It prepared us to understand and delight in this invitation from our Savior when Jesus leaned in and he said, now, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Jesus is the rest that we are longing for. Now, now I want to be careful. Am I saying that as Christians here in the New Covenant that we don't need this principle of weekly rest and worship? No, I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I would say most of you probably need to hear this. You desperately need this. You need to write this into your weekly calendar to stop, to rest, to worship, to savor Christ. Now, and Sunday, if you're able to, if your work schedule permits it, you should, you should make that day Sunday. You should gather together with the people of God to worship together, to see and behold Christ and put aside everything that day and let it be a day of rest and savoring and surrendering. Yes. But the Apostle Paul here reminds us we're not to pass judgment on each other regarding those days of rest. So we're not to be legalistic and imposing our understanding of this rest onto others. That's what he's saying here. But while we're gracious, make no mistake, rest is a foundational aspect of worship. I fear that many of us are neglecting it. So let's get back to that. Worship is rest. It rests in his provision. But now we're going to move forward. I want you to look with me now to verses 4 to 8, where we're going to unpack the Passover. It says this, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. But you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Here we learn the elementary lesson that worship remembers. So the whole purpose of the Passover celebration and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was to, through food, through liturgy, through worship, to direct the Israelites' attention back to the redemption that God brought about when he brought them out of Egypt. And interestingly, the text here doesn't unpack all of the aspects of the Passover. Um, there are other texts that do, and when we study those, we'll do that. But today, we're going we're gonna to limit our focus and we'll just summarize. So what happened in the Passover is that they... They commemorated what happened during that 10th plague when the angel of death passed over Egypt. Remember the, the Israelites spread the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and they were saved. And that was the event where finally they were sent out of Egypt. And when they left, they were in a big hurry. And so they had bread that didn't have time to rise. And that's why he said, for seven days then, you're going to eat bread that hasn't risen. You're going to eat the unleavened bread. And as you eat this bread and as you take these eight days in the first month of your year, you are going to remind yourselves that you were slaves that were brought out of captivity. You're going to remind yourselves that your God is strong to save. You're going to remind yourselves that you are the redeemed ones. You're going to remember. Now, in what was certainly not a coincidence, and again, so if Christ is the substance, these are the shadow. Let me just, you, many of you have seen this, but maybe you haven't. Jesus gathered together his disciples during the Passover celebration, so as they were celebrating God's deliverance, Jesus gathered them together and he said, we're going to eat together. And as he sat them at the table, he took the bread, and what did he say? He broke the bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See what he did there? Jesus, who is the substance that all of these things were pointing forward to, said, you realize this celebration was always pointing forward to me. Now, of course, for the Israelites, they were looking back. Did they even realize that they were looking forward to Christ? Probably not. But Jesus comes and he says, look at this. Isn't this amazing? All of this was preparing you to see the deliverance that I have brought. So just like the, the Israelites had to come back and they had to worship and have the ceremony and the bread to remember their deliverance, Jesus said, you too now are going to come back to this table and you are going to remember that you are the redeemed people. You too are going to come to this table time after time and you are going to eat and you are going to drink so as to remember the power and the deliverance of your God. Worship remembers. It retells which is why month after month we come back to the communion table. 
Which is why we sing these songs recounting all that God has done for us. All that He has accomplished. His power, His might, His deliverance. And we pray these prayers and we preach these sermons. Why? Because that's what it is. Worship is remembering. Rooting, rooted in what God has done. Now we have to move quicker now. So the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, these things took place on the first month of the year. So if we can go back to that big calendar on the fridge, we've, we've already looked at the weekly rest And now we've looked at the first month and we see the first month was dedicated like this eight-day block to remembrance. But now we're going to move about three or four months forward, which uh, after the first harvest, we find the next two religious festivals. And I'm not going to read the text because these two are relatively straightforward. Verses 9 all the way to the end of verse 22 describes the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Weeks. And so here's what we're going to unpack together. We learn this elementary lesson. Worship anticipates. Worship anticipates. So these two ceremonies were connected with that that first harvest. One commentator notes, while the Passover and festival of unleavened bread celebrated the Lord's deliverance from the old land, remembers, right? The offering of first fruits and the festival of weeks celebrated his provision in the new land. So remember, when, when God gave these instructions to Moses, they were still wandering in the wilderness. So that's interesting, right? God comes to Moses and he says, here's what you're going to do. When you get that first harvest, you're going to come in and you're going you're to wave that harvest before the Lord and you're going to offer it to him. He was giving these instructions to a man, Moses, who would never even step foot into the promised land. And so Moses carefully writes these down and he teaches the priests and they're, they're ready. You know, someday we're going to get into the land. But remember, they were in the wilderness for 40 long years. 40 years of wandering. 40 years of of eating manna from heaven and quail that the Lord provides. Right? 40 years of being uh, nomads, right? Having no place to call your own. Not being able to plant crops and fields. 40 years. Imagine with me for a moment the first offering of the first fruits. The priests are now in the the tavern. They've taken possession of the promised land. People have kind of taken their allotments that they were promised from the Lord. They started to sow their seed. Priests are in the tabernacle waiting and then one day in walks a man and he's got his first harvest. And he says, I'm here to bring the offering of the first fruits. And they grab these and they're waving them before the Lord and they're celebrating and they put them on the altar and they burn them. And and that tangible ceremony was meant to teach some things. First of all, it was meant to teach gratitude. right? It was meant to teach that we recognize that all that we have comes from the Lord. So here's here's my very best, the first of my crop. It's for the Lord because everything's from Him. Right? This land was from him. This crop is from him. So take it. But it also was meant to teach anticipation. He, he didn't put that on the altar assuming, well, and that was it. I got, that's the end of the harvest. I'll have nothing left. No, he put it on the altar saying, take it. I trust that the God who gave me this is going to give me so much more. The God who kept his promise in bringing us to this land, the God who kept his promise in growing these crops is going to keep his promise by providing, in, in spite of me laying down this first fruit of my offering. It was anticipation, expectation. And in the same way, so too is our worship. Right? We are the looking forward people. We are the trusting in faith people. We are the giving God everything that we have because we know that as we pour ourselves out, he gives more. He, he blesses us. He pours into us. And of course, our expectation goes deeper than the first fruits of the crop, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul, in in what was not a mistake, again, he uses this language. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Listen to this language. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Paul picks up this first fruit language, this celebration that every Israelite would have participated in, feeling the gratitude, feeling the anticipation. And Paul said, hey, you know that anticipation we feel? Jesus is the first fruit. Jesus is the one that we point to and we say, God has been so good. And just like Christ rose from the dead, I know that more is coming. And our worship should be that way. That in spite of our hardships, in spite of our suffering, in spite of sweet Emma right now in pain, in spite of many of you right now struggling in your faith, in spite of wayward children, in spite of a downward hearts, in spite of it all, we can point forward and say, but Christ was raised, so too will we. So we have hope, Paul says. Hope that sees beyond the grave. 
Peter used that language all the time, right? Joy unspeakable, full of glory. Why? Where's our joy rooted? It's rooted in faith, in trusting that God is going to provide, even when all of our circumstances say that he won't. Even when the first fruit is burning on the altar and the smoke's rising up, we're saying there will be more where that came from because our God is the God who keeps his promises. Amen? Now the final three ceremonies that we're going to study all fell on the seventh month. Back to the calendar on the fridge. Weekly celebration of rest. First month, we have that remembrance of, of God's deliverance. A few months later, the crops come in and we've got this celebration of God's just gratitude and anticipation of the way that God provides for us. But then on the seventh month, we have this almost an entire month dedicated to worship. And this month is vibrant. It's got three festivals built in and they, they're different and yet they flow into each other. It's beautiful. I'm going to read the whole text. It's a lot of text. And as we read this, uh, we're going to see three ceremonies. One of them we've already unpacked. If you were here when we unpacked the Day of Atonement, that's coupled into the month. So you remember that? And the scapegoat wandered away over the horizon. That's built into the seventh month. But hear now God's word. I'm going to read from verse 23 all the way to the end in verse 44. Here's the Feast of Trumpets. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. It goes on in verse 26 to explain the Day of Atonement. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves, that is, you'll humble yourselves, and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. Whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. Then he moves into the next ceremony, the Feast of Booths. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It's a holy, solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your freewill offerings, which you give to the Lord. He goes back to explain now what happens on the Feast of Booths. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It's a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generation may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. Wow, so there's a lot that we can unpack there. But here's what I'd like to, this elementary lesson I'd like to flesh out for you. In these final three ceremonies on this seventh month, we learn that worship expresses. So just picture this month. Try and just immerse yourself into it for a moment. First day of the month comes. It's the seventh month. Your whole week is built into this idea that the seventh day is a day that's set apart for the Lord. Well, here you are, the seventh month in the year, and that principle expands larger. And that first day, you're resting, you're worshiping, and trumpets are being blasted to proclaim. It's a day of rejoicing and victory and worship. Then you get 10 days into that month and you have the Day of Atonement. 
And remember, we talked about the Day of Atonement. It's a somber day. He says, you afflict yourselves. You humble yourselves. You quiet yourselves. You remind yourselves that God is holy and you are not. And that's a huge problem. How can you be at one with God? So you have the sacrifice. And you watch as the high priest lays his hands on these animals. And one is sent out of the camp and you never see it again. And blood is shed. And it's a sober and quiet day. But a few days later... You start this feast. And again, it's, it's restful, but this is like a joyful rest. You're all building tents and you're, you're living in booths to remind yourselves of the, the years that you spent in the wilderness. And people are feasting together and celebrating together. And it's, it's this joyful picnic almost built into your calendar. And that lasts for seven days with a, a big day on the first day, a big day on the last day. All that being said, it was quite the month Trumpets and celebrating, weeping and sacrificing, camping and and enjoying meals together. And all of that was prescribed by the Lord. All of that expressiveness was appropriate, each in its own time. There's a breadth to it. You find that same breadth when you read the Psalms, don't you? You find Psalms where the psalmist is on top of the world and he's delighting and celebrating and he's telling you to bang on, sounds like everything, you know, bang on the drum and the, the cymbal and the, grab a lyre and play that. And I think this is how you play a lyre. But he's, you know, anything that can make noise, make some noise, God is awesome. And then you find Psalms where he, he says, Lord, what, do you even see me? Do you even care? Do you even know? There's a breadth to it. We see this all over the Old Testament. Truth be told, we see it all over the Bible. And I would just, I would love to see us capture some of that breadth in our worship. And I've said this before, but let me just give a disclaimer. I've said this before, so it probably feels like, here's Pastor beating his drum again. If you don't see this in the Bible, tune me out right now. But if you see this in the Bible, could, just, could you lean in and listen close for a moment? Look at the breadth of worship of God's people. I was talking to a brother Christian brother. I love him dearly. We were talking about all the different expressive pieces that we find within the church family. And instead of talking about the church in North America, because that's always easy, let's talk about us. Let's talk about Redeemer. There's a breadth here. And there's people on different sides of the spectrum. So there are some of us where reverence and uh, and sobriety come naturally. Amen? There's some of us, that's just the way we, that's the way we are. That, That fits for us. And it's sweet and it's appropriate. We come to the Lord and it's almost as if Every time we come into the place of worship, it's like we're coming into the Day of Atonement. Quiet, solemn, and when you watch that person, you get this beautiful sense that they know that God is holy, holy, holy. And it is humbling that we could even come before Him. Praise God. We need that in our expressiveness. Amen? We need it. And you watch other people, and they come to worship, and you see joy and exuberance in them, And it's like every day they come to worship, they're coming into the Feast of Trumpets. You think, I hope nobody gives them a trumpet. Who knows what would happen? They're just on top. And you watch them worship. And you think, man, that person understands that God is is good. And that God loves us and he delights in his people. And they're expressive and dancing. and, And we need that, don't we? There are times, amen? That's like, that's not Pastor Levi's idea. That's the Bible. Both of those are appropriate. But here's the thing. As I read the Old Testament, and I'm reading Leviticus 23, it's not as if a certain batch of people come out this day, and then God says, all right, so that's good. You've, you've worshipped in the way that's comfortable for you. And then he says, now let's bring out the joyful people. Okay, now let's bring back out the sober people. It, that's not. All of God's people are stretching themselves, expanding themselves to, to appropriately express the breadth of, of our great God. But I don't see that happen in our churches often. Now, and I don't think that's going to happen overnight, but here's my challenge, and you can, again, if you don't think this is from the Bible, tune it out, that's okay, we can talk later, you can tell me why it's not there. But if you see that in the Bible, here's my challenge for us, and my challenge for me. Let's let's turn the dial a little bit so for, for you joy people, there are times when you just need to come in quiet. I mean, Good Friday, that was the most powerful service I've been in in such a long time. We came in quiet. We, sat, we weren't late, we were on time, we were early, we sat in our seats, we prepared our hearts. 
We bowed our heads. We worshiped with reverence. We wept. It was beautiful. We came to the Lord's table. That was, that was the note for a Good Friday, wasn't it? But then Easter Sunday came, and it's like we never turned the dial. <laughs> Easter Sunday, we come and celebrate that Christ is risen, and so too will we, and our hands were still in our pockets. And I just, I think that we can grow in that on both sides. So here, here's, I, I think we need each other. Hear that. I think we need to stop judging each other. Don't look at the sober person and think, that person has no joy in their life. They've got lots of joy. And don't look at the, the joyful person and say, that person doesn't think God is holy. They know God's holy. We need each other. Let's learn from each other. Let's grow together. Let's find a breadth and a balance and a beauty. Let's, I, somebody said this week um, that more is caught than taught. Right? Is that right? More is caught than taught. Meaning, I could say this stuff from the pulpit a hundred times. It doesn't matter. You know what our kids are going to learn? They're going to learn what mom and dad do. When people engage with us, when new people come in to worship with us, let them catch the whole breadth of it. Let them see people weeping in reverence and awe before our great God, acknowledging our sin, repenting, trusting. Let them see people rejoicing, dancing at times, celebrating, clapping. Our great God. Let's see it all. I aspire for that. I, I would love to see us aspire for that. It, moves, it leads into our next thing. You know, why, why harp on this so much? Because we learn from this whole text, worship matters. In fact, I go a step further and say, worship's the whole point. Why did God save the Israelites? Exodus 8.1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go. Why? So that they may worship me. They were saved so as to be worshipers. Um, John Piper has this great quote. You've probably heard it. He says, missions exists because worship doesn't. And what does he mean? He means we go to the nations. Why? Because the nations should be worshiping God. And they're not yet. So let's go and let's tell them because God is worthy of their worship. And let's go to our neighbors. Why? Because God deserves their worship. And let's go to our coworkers. Why? Because God deserves their worship. Missions exist because there are people, there are hearts manufactured, made by our great God who don't give him the praise that he deserves. We've got to tell them, he deserves your praise. Worship's the whole point. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify, we were made to worship. Leviticus exists because worship exists. Why do they need atonement? Right? Why did the Israelites even need atonement? So that they could draw near to God, so as to worship Him. Pastor Paul used this great analogy in the preaching workshop. It's like a, atonement was like the ticket, the ticket that gets you into the stadium. Right? You, can't, you couldn't draw near to the stadium, there couldn't be at one mint, because our sin kept us afar, but then through atonement, now we got a ticket, now we can go inside. When you get the ticket, you don't go back to your house and watch it on the TV. That would be weird. What's the whole point of the ticket? To get you inside. Why, why do we need holiness? So that we can draw near to our holy God. Because we're not content sitting at the back. We want to get right up to the front. We want to come to him in a way that glorifies him and honors him. We want to draw close. Why do we need the priests? The priests are like the ushers, like bringing us to the right seat, telling us when to stand, when to sit, telling us how to observe this, directing our eyes to what we've come to enjoy. All of it exists because of worship. Worship is the point. It's the purpose. It's everything. Therefore, corporate worship was the big rock in every Israelite's calendar. Before they were farmers, before they were fathers, before they were husbands, they were primarily and fundamentally worshipers. And so we're looking back at that fridge calendar. What is the lesson that you're learning from that calendar? Worship matters. You were made to worship made to follow Christ, to rest in his provision, to remember God's faithfulness, to anticipate his coming, to respond to his character, to breathe in his goodness in corporate worship, and to breathe out his praise as you go forth into the world. That is why you exist. But here's a question. What does your calendar say? When you start your year and you, you put in the big rocks, the things that displace everything else. What are the things in your life that displace everything else? 
Is it worship? Is worship front and center in everything? Because that's where life is found. That's where satisfaction, isn't it amazing? I, we were praying in the kitchen. It's amazing. God calls us to come and worship. He calls us to come and to, to lift up our praise and to pour it out for Him. But it, it would be just of God if our worship drained us. Like if we just like gave Him everything we had and then we walked away exhausted. It's like, okay, well we gave Him all that we had because He deserves it, but now we're spent. That would be just. He could have built it that way. But instead, our great, gracious Heavenly Father said, you come and you pour it all out. You give me everything you've got. And when you walk away, guess what? You're going to feel like there's more in the tank than when you came. As you pour out for me, I'm going to fill you up. Let your life, let this church be about one thing above all else. Glorifying God as we enjoy Him forever. And then I'm going to conclude very quickly with one last observation, which really I want to end where we began. Here's our final elementary lesson. Worship trusts. The worship calendar that the Israelites structured their lives around was not the result of a vision-casting meeting. It's not as if Moses and Aaron got away and grabbed some leaders and said, Let's just, what, what should this look like? Let's brainstorm. Nope. Verse one, said, verse 1 says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying... Right, worship was God's idea. And He said, here's how you're going to approach Me. Here's how you're going to... You're going to worship Me this way. The Lord spoke... Moses listened. The people obeyed because they trusted. And that is worship that pleases the Lord. One of the things that we've learned elsewhere in the book of Leviticus is that not all worship is pleasing to the Lord. Right? That was the story of Nadab and Abihu. They came before the Lord. They had instructions, but they said, forget the instructions. I think we're going to do some novelty. We're going to try and approach God this way. And of course, he struck them down. That, that story ends in death and ruin. Because we're not the innovators. We are the listeners, the obeyers, and the trusters. That's what we learn throughout the book of Leviticus. And that elementary lesson carries forward into the New Testament. But let me tell you how. How then do we approach God? We read Leviticus and we think it is so important that we approach God the right way. How do we then approach God? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one approaches God except through me. See, we're going to learn a number of elementary lessons about worship. But this lesson stands above them all. We can only approach God on His terms. And He's made those terms clear. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Any other approach to God is, is like the strange fire that Nadab and Abihu brought. And I, this section used to be really long. I'm going to truncate it because there's all kinds of strange fire that we can bring. I mean, like universalism. Universalism says that every religion leads us to God and every path leads there. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus said, right? No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. So I, you could say universalism is strange fire, but I would imagine for most of us that's not our challenge. So I want to highlight two in particular. And here's this first one. It's so dangerous. You know what's a strange fire? Legalism. How many of us have caught ourselves swinging that strange fire in our hearts? Have you ever felt yourself saying, I can't, I can't pray to God? I was, I was arguing with my wife last night, wrestling with my kids this morning. I can't pray. He doesn't want to hear from me. Maybe you come to a corporate worship and you're like, how am I supposed to sing? Am I supposed to fake it? I haven't read my Bible in a week. How, I'm not, how can I sing to God? Have you ever caught yourself feeling like my my stuff that I do, my effort or lack thereof is, is indicative of my worthiness to come before God. That's legalism. That's strange fire. That leads to death and ruin. Hear me. You have never once obeyed God enough. You've never once read your Bible enough, loved others enough, served enough to earn your way into God's presence. If you've ever come to worship saying, I can come before God today because I had a killer week, that's strange fire. You cannot come before God because of your killer week. Nor, can, nor should you stay away from God because of your lousy week. You come to God because of Jesus. He is the way. He's the approach. If we could obey our way to the Father, there'd be no need for Jesus. But we can't. 
We all fall short of the glory of God. We all need rescue. We all need a Savior. But here's one more strange fire before we close that I think is maybe dangerous after a sermon like this. It's the strange fire of emotivism. How many of us, I'm, I will confess, I struggle with this because of my disposition. I'm a bit of a feeler. How many of us judge our relationship with God and our ability to approach Him based on how we feel? Like, oh, I just feel cold. I just feel this. I can't worship God. I'd be faking it because I feel off. Uh, you know, pastor just said that we should have joy and we should have reverence, and I feel like I have neither right now. I feel like I'm a, I'm a robot. I can't... And we assume because I don't have these feelings, because it's not all bubbling up inside of me, that something's broken inside of me, I can't approach God. It, that's strange fire. You approach God because of Jesus. And that's good news, because some days you roll out of bed and you just feel like you're at the end of your rope. And you feel like there's not even an ounce of me that, that wants to sing. It's not an ounce of me that wants to fellowship I want to crawl back into my bed. Can I really be a worshiper feeling that way? Yes. Yeah, you can. Because it's not about how you feel. It's about what Christ has done. Isn't that good news? Some days you're going to feel good. Isn't that good news? I love those days. I wish those days happened more often. Some days you just feel great. But some days you feel absolutely lousy and it lasts for years. God is still worthy of worship and you are still a worshiper. Because Christ's blood was shed for you and the way has been made in spite of your feelings. Therefore, this morning, we're going to approach our Father again in worship. We're going to sing two songs today instead of one. I thought about flipping the whole service and I thought that might be much. But I wanted to give us some time to respond and I want to give the disclaimer of don't feel pressure of uh, I, I need to express this way or I need to be emotional this way. Don't feel any of that at all. Here's what I want you to feel today. Gratitude reverence, awe, wonder, humility, joy, the whole breadth of it all. Some verses are going to cause you to want to fall on your knees and cry. Some verses are going to make you want to dance. You don't need to do either of those things. But I would just say this. Engage with God, with all of who you are, and invite Him to stretch you just a little bit. Invite Him to stretch that joy muscle, that reverence muscle. Give Him praise that He deserves. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have brought our worship to all the wrong places. We've done it so many times. Um, Lord, some of those things we identify, we readily see. You know, some of us have bowed down at the altar of, of sin. Lord, we talked about last week, sexual sin and pornography. It's an altar that we've often bowed down at, bringing our worship to the wrong place and walking away empty and unsatisfied. That's what, the, that's what idols do. Unlike you, when we worship the idols, we walk away with less than what we had. Some of us bow down and worship idols that are more respectable idols, like our sports, our vacation, our leisure, our TV, our job, our family. Lord, we want to bow down at your altar because every good gift actually comes from you. And so we want to thank the giver we want to worship the giver. We want to delight in you. Lord, and we confess that our hearts are prone to wander. We feel it prone to leave the God we love. So God, we just confess today that we need your help. Thank you that you are generous to meet us in our need. We pray for the help of your Holy Spirit to direct our affection to you. To direct our attention to you. To stir us to praise even when we feel exhausted and depleted. To stir us to praise even when we haven't measured up to the standards that we know that we want to reach. To come before you in praise and thanksgiving even though the fig tree does not bud and there's no grape on the vine and the olive clove fails and the field produces no fruit. We want to say with Habakkuk, yet I will rejoice in God. I'll rejoice in God my Savior. Let that be the cry of our hearts. So, Father, I pray for your people. I pray for this church. Lord, we want to get everything right. But in particular, Lord, we want to get this right. I pray that you would help us to grow as the years go forward, to grow in our corporate worship, that, that we would capture the, the scope of who you are. 
introduce things to our liturgy, Lord. Maybe there's things that we, aren't, we haven't even incorporated into our corporate worship that we're really lacking in, Lord, that would be so helpful for our worship. We just invite you to speak. Lord, we just humbly lay this at your feet. We want these gatherings to be the kinds of gatherings that bring you so much glory because you are worthy of it all. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Worship team, would you lead us?